Hey, thanks so much for joining us on Cloudy with the Chance of Podcast. I joined with meteorologist McCall Vrydegs, and we've got another special guest as well. Uh, McCall, we've, uh, we are well into spring at this point. We're actually rounding out April now as we continue to work from home and social distance. Absolutely. And I think I knew immediately when we went into spring because my tree allergies went chaotic. That along with my three-year-old who is here today. So if we see her running around in the background or you're listening and hearing a child, um, we are all, you know, social distancing, as you said, and doing the best that we can. Um, but I am happy, even though we are going through this pandemic, that we are getting to warmer weather. And that means we can all go outside and, and get the energy out a little bit. I agree. Yeah, it's definitely uh, makes me happy when we're forecasting and I see like a couple days in a row where we're dry. I don't even care what the temperature is because I just know people are just like, I just want to go for a walk and let the kids play in the backyard. They can wear their jacket. So uh, yeah, it definitely makes our job. We're kind of forecasting with an even, uh, I guess, different perspective because we just know that that emphasis on, you know, pleasant weather is even stronger for people because they really are holding out hope to just go for a walk in the neighborhood, you know? Yeah, and uh, I feel that the way that my style of forecasting, and I've noticed it with you as well, has shifted because of that and trying to focus on, you know, the brighter parts of the forecast to try and bring some joy back to people's lives. Um, but, you know, during this whole thing, we got to continue to work. And so that means we have to uh, continue to do our podcast because this may be the bright spot for people uh, every couple of weeks to get a new podcast from us. Exactly. So if you have time and you're able to listen or watch us, uh, we have a guest this week that is super impor important to the Miami Valley. So this area is known for allergies. We have high pollen counts. People in Southwest Ohio always complain about their allergy symptoms. And of course, the weather plays a part when we look at years that are warm, years that are dry. Um, sometimes we could see that overlap where we get the tree pollen, grass pollen, weed pollen that kind of overlap each other, especially if we're warmer than normal. So um, the guest that we have is Brian Huxtable. Hello, Brian. You've been able to see him for the past couple of minutes, but welcome to the show. And Brian, would you mind just explaining to people what is it you do exactly, and how does it relate to pollen counts? Okay, I, uh, Brian Huxtable, I work with, uh, I'm, I work for Public Health, Baton Montgomery County, and we have an air pollution division called the Regional Air Pollution Control Agency, or RAPCA. Mm -hmm. um, it's, we also, for years, even before I started with the agency, we've operated a pollen and mold sampler in the Dayton area. Um, and we would always generate hourly, or I'm sorry, daily pollen counts for the public, which we would give to the news to report. Um, one of my duties is um, I, I kind of wear, I, you know, jack of all trades in the office, I, I like to call myself, but um, one of it is, you know, reporting, you know, being kind of the face of the media a little bit for the, for the agency, for RAPCA, uh, reporting these numbers to the public. Uh, we all, I also do forecasting, air pollution forecasting in the office as well. One of my questions has always been, how are you collecting these numbers? Like what, what goes into the process of that? Uh, for the pollen and count numbers, we have a uh, what we call a Burkhart sampler, and it sits on the top of a building on Sinclair's campus. We send someone down to that sampler every day in the morning about 7 o'clock, and uh, it's, a, it's a slide that would go under a microscope. So you take a slide, you put a light uh, layer of uh, grease on that slide, and you sit it on the sampler. The sampler runs for 24 hours, and it basically has a blower that blows air across the sampler or the slide, and then um, we have someone read that slide under a microscope, and they physically go through and they count actual pollen um, grains or mold spores, and they come up with a number, and that's how we report to the public. Wow, so what does, I guess what goes into, are they considered, are they pollen technician? Like what is the title for the counters, or um, uh, like what would be the background of someone that does this? We've actually had, um, we've been a part of the National Aller Allergy Bureau for years where um, we've reported our counts to them. Um, we don't report to them right now because we, in the last fall, we lost our certified pollen and mold reader. Gotcha. Um, you, don't you don't necessarily have to be certified reader, but it does help to have some background. You know, there's books you can use to, to look at uh, the, the slides and identify specific pollen species. And there is a technique. I don't, I've never counted. Okay. Um, I don't plan a count, but uh, there is a technique that they go through to actually generate the numbers. But 
if you're a national allergy bureau uh, approved agency and you have a reader, we would send our, re our numbers to that agency. And then we get a lot of requests um, from researchers for our data. So all that data sits in, in, that, um, in their database basically. Gotcha. But for years, we would put when we have anytime we have a pollen a certified reader, we would send our data there. We don't right now because we lost that person back in the fall, and it's a process. They have to take a test and you know go to a, it's a I think they have to go to Atlanta to take a test, um, and it's you know, it does cost money too, so that makes it problematic for us to keep that person in in that position. Gotcha, Brian. In your experience, is there something to the fact that people say that allergies are worse here than elsewhere? I heard something along the lines that maybe we have so many species of trees that it does impact more people. Is there anything to that, or are we just making things up? Uh, I mean, I've you know, it's all anecdotal. I I hear people tell me it's you know you hear all the time on the news it's really bad. One of the reasons I think that we tend to hit high on these lists because they look for one, they look for areas that people who supply counts, not every city gotcha. has, so they, they're looking for areas that actually supply pollen counts, one. And I think if you look at some of these studies, they also look at the number of like allergists or immunologists within a certain per capita. And we apparently have a lot of those. And I think they also look at prescriptions that are written for people. So there's a combination of things that kind of probably put us high on the list, one of them is the fact that we do have the counts, but from what I understand, the, we, you know, there are a lot of prescriptions being written for allergy meds, and there apparently are a lot of doctors in the area that specialize in allergies. I think those are some of the, th the, the factors they use to, to rank different cities and, and allergies. Some of the criteria. So you yeah. kind of mentioned that you need, um, not need, but that you have and you would prefer to have uh, certified counter, but what's interesting this year, and people may not have known, is that um, RACA, you guys have dabbled with an automated sensor. So let's talk a little bit about what that is, that was, what your, you know, goal moving forward is, because I don't know if people even know that, I'm not sure they knew someone was humanly, like, counting it, and then that we also, now with, you know, computers getting more savvy, um, you can have something like an automated sensor that can give a pollen count. So why don't you explain a little bit about that for this year? Okay, a little bit of background. I mentioned that, you know, we had lost our certified counter. So we were looking at trying to replace the counter. We always shut down. We've been shutting down the pollen and mold sampler in the wintertime because when the counts are low and it's a bit of a safety issue to send our techs out on top of the rooftops when it's icy out. So um, we had over the winter, we kind of talked about like, well, maybe we'll look into some sort of an automated sampler. Um, for this next season in light of having just lost our pollen counter and we were the plan is still to replace that counter and we are when the sampler's running not right now we do produce daily counts but so we did sign a, a one-year lease to operate and test this automated sampler and one of the benefits of this the automated sampler over the count is right now with the count with the, with the, the manual count we only do five days a week the automated sample will also give us the weekend counts. Yeah. Um, so when somebody goes on vacation, calls in sick, the automated sampler keeps running where we might have holes in the, with the manual count. So it, it might provide a little bit more consistency, but the, the idea was to have a season 2020 side by side where we compare the, the manual counts and the automated counts and just see how close they are. Um, and if we felt comfortable with the data, then we would potentially pursue purchasing a device to run, um, you know, 24-7 and, and have those numbers to report. And, and th at that point, it would be a question whether we would keep doing the manual counts or not. But we hadn't made that, this with, with COVID hitting when it did. Yeah. We were fortunate that we had this machine running um, and we really weren't prepared to kind of use the data like we are right now. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know how it'll affect us going forward beyond Well, you're not this. doing as many manual checks. Are you seeing that it, it somewhat compares to what we would expect, even though you don't have the, the dual option? I feel like the range is pretty close. Um, we had about, um, we started our, our manual sampler up in, I believe it was mid-February, and then by mid-March we had shut it down because of COVID. So we had about, I'd say we had about two good weeks of comparable data where we actually were, were reporting 
significant, we were reporting significant levels of pollen and mold on the actual manual sampler to compare it to the automated sampler. And during that time period, I felt like the pollen was, was pretty close. I mean, it would kind of rise, they would rise and fall with each other. The categories seemed to be pretty close as far as like, is it high today or medium? The counts themselves wouldn't always align, but I felt like the numbers were looking pretty good. But again, that was over a very short time period. Um, I didn't feel like our mold counts were probably very accurate. They, I thought the mold on the automated sample was, was much higher than what we would normally see on the, on the manual counts. Yeah. So that is, I mean, good to know for now, but uh, you kind of just alluded to COVID. So COVID happened and we're all in a pandemic right now. And as an agency, like you said, um, you're not able to send your techs up to at least do the manual counts. What, I guess, has there been any update? I know on the website it has May 1st if that you guys might yeah. be able to get back out and start working, but have you had any updates from the state or, you know, in your department, you know, specifically? No, I, I'm guessing May 1st is not going to happen, but maybe May, um, well, I guess the 4th, I think is Monday. So I think maybe we would look for the second week of May potentially to get back out. I think we're still waiting for direction on the state when we can go back into the field to collect the, uh, we also, part of this, we also have a collection of network of air pollution monitors, which the state is involved in. And they told us not to go out for that. And then we're also, we kind of use that same uh, methodology or reasoning on not doing the pollen and mold sampler. Cause we do have to access other buildings, come in contact with people. So that's where that comes from. But so as soon as the state allows us to go back out to service monitors, we'll probably start collect, I think we'll start collecting the samples from, from the manual sampler. Um, and I don't think anything's going to happen next week, but maybe the, I'm hopeful the following week we'll kind of get things back to get, you know, get them going again. Well, that would be wonderful. And for you, since you have a year lease on the automated um, sensor, you know, like you said, at this point, May is typically when tree pollen starts to drop off and then it's grass pollen that's next. And then, yes, so at least you might be able to get the dual options for grass and weed and, and weed pollen in the Miami Valley. McCall, I don't know if you suffer from hay fever and ragweed, but I do Ugh, in the fall. Well, for, for me, it's the grass pollen and the tree oh, pollen. I'm just like okay. bumped up for like six months there. I just like I'm in awful shape. I used to love the smell of freshly cut grass, but as I became an adult, I think I started to become more and more sensitive to grass pollen and went and you know, it, it, when you live in a neighborhood, there's yeah, the peer good. pressure of mowing the lawn, like one person <laughs> does it and then everybody does. So like, I just don't want to go outside for 24 hours when it happens. <laughs> so what do you think then, Brian, for um, the other seasons at least? Uh, We're hope. yeah, if we, can get this, if we can get the manual counts going again in the next week or two, we should be able to capture the grass season because that's really just now usually the grass under a traditional season with if weather's kind of normal we'd see grass start to ramp up in may and peak in that may june time frame um i've, I've always felt like the tree season was kind of the, between tree and ragweed in the fall those are the two dominant pollen seasons grass counts themselves never seem to rival the tree physical counts or the ragweed counts but people can still be susceptible to the, you know have the symptoms for them so um I'm hopeful that we'll catch the tail end of the tree season right now and then uh, capture grass. And then, of course, if we're running in the fall, we'll be able to capture the ragweed season, which would be um, which would be important as well. Yeah, definitely. Now, you also mentioned um, that you guys obviously are keeping uh, sensors on air pollution, air quality. That's big. McCall and I, we, you know, and the National Weather Service. Um, you know, we, we talk when we have air quality alerts and things of that nature. So if people aren't maybe familiar with what that is, how are you reading this sensor that, you know, what, what are you doing? Cause you said that that is something you specifically are, are quite involved in. Yeah, we have a, um, again, a little background. We have a network of air pollution monitors in our six county jurisdiction. And that would include, uh, we have a six county jurisdiction, but we only have monitors in five counties. We have monitors in uh, Miami, Clark, Preble, Montgomery, and Green, and it's a combination of ozone and PM 2.5 monitors. Those are the two pollutants that we're most concerned with as far as air quality goes in reporting those to the public. So um, usually, you know, some 
ozone is a summertime pollutant. So when the weather starts to get warmer in kind of the May, June, July timeframe, you have a chance for high ozone levels and we would issue an air pollution advisory. So we have our ozone monitors that mo you know, monitor ambient levels of ozone in the atmosphere. And we know under certain weather conditions, ozone will reach a certain level. So we try to predict, as, as you would do with the forecasting, we try to forecast for what we think the ozone levels are going to be. And if we think they're going to be um, in a range that we consider to be unhealthy for sensitive individuals, that would be elderly people with breathing problems, uh, young children, then we try to issue uh, a message, an alert that would tell people that we think it's going to be high. And this is how you can take precautions to kind of protect yourself during those periods. Gotcha. What are some weather factors that go into play when you're making that decision? Is there a temperature range, relative humidity range? For ozone, temperature is a big factor and is, is in humidity as a, as a factor as well. I'd have to dig up the actual, we actually work with a, uh, con, a consulting firm called uh, Sonoma Te Technologies and they put some models together for us and they help us identify these, I, these, these parameters. But basically it's temperature. You're probably talking as long as if you can get, you know, in the upper 70s into the 80s and above, that that's one of the parameters. Also, relative humidity, high humidity is will actually kind of like it's an ozone killer. It kind of it, it squashes ozone formation. So we're in the springtime, we're looking for those sunny, dry um, days with the right wind direction. Um, ozone is not emitted directly from a tailpipe or a factory. It's a it forms in the atmosphere. So what you need is you need these transport pollutants, we refer to them as. So um, if you get a, more of a southwest wind with Cincinnati, Louisville down, you have more, uh, there's more, uh, you know, people living south of us than there are yeah. north as far as the bigger mm -hmm. cities. So anytime you have an air mass that travels up kind of from the south, we tend to see higher ozone values. That's not to say that you still can't have high high ozone values from a different wind direction. Mm -hmm. But generally, we're looking for those southerly winds, uh, the right temps, probably 80 plus, and then drier air masses tend to be the big things. There are some specific um, upper atmosphere parameters that have been identified by uh, STI for us. But really, the, the big ones we look for, just like wind, temperature, and relative humidity. That's super interesting. I mean. Mm -hmm. It kind of, I never really thought about the populations to our south and the mm -hmm. fact that there's so much, that there can be more pollutants that would just kind of make their way up towards us. Um, I know that we're not really in prime ozone time right now because we're coming out of, you know, we're just in spring. And with COVID-19 and a lot of people working from home, it's kind of like as people start to get back into work, it'll be kind of like when we get into, I guess, ozone season. So, um, what have you, I mean, what have you noticed? I know some of the big cities like LA and uh, DC that kind of always have heavy traffic, that there has been some, you know, positivity to not working and not driving as much. Um, have you noticed anything just being in this like field? You know, this question has come up before and I've done a little, in, a little investigating, um, looking into the numbers and Right now, ozone is it's it's pre really ozone season, so that the levels are low, the the air quality for ozone is good, but I have seen potentially slightly ozone lower ozone values for this time of year as uh, compared to previous years. But it's it's I, I don't want to say it's insignificant, but it's very small mm -hmm. and it's a very short data set to kind of to look at. But um, but like you said, you know, transportation, cars, trucks, mobile sources make up a, you know, a very large um, portion of our air pollution. And so um, from what I understand, traffic counts are down maybe as close to 50% with this. Mm -hmm. um, so that you would think it would show itself somewhere. And I feel like it might be showing itself in some lower ozone values. But again, it's the air quality is good. So it's just now it's a little bit better. So it's not like it's taken us from a a poor air quality situation and putting us into a, a good air quality situation. So it's, it is, I think there's something there, but mm -hmm. um, I really wouldn't, people probably aren't experiencing anything different from it. Right. And I mean, it might be interesting to see as well as we go through summer and things slowly start to get back to normal, if there is a slow surge, I guess, 
What about, you had mentioned, what is the other thing that you guys monitor besides ozone PM2? Or? It's, it's called uh, fine particulate matter, okay. PM2.5. I mean, there's a lot of different names to it. So this is very, very tiny particles in the atmosphere that people can breathe into their lungs. And if it's high enough, people who are sensitive, these sensitive groups can be affected. Um, and really in the last couple of years, PMs, the PM2.5 has really dropped out because we used to have with um, all the power plants mm -hmm. have switched over to coal or there's been more controls. A lot of the, the PM2.5 pollution came from uh, power plants because when they burn coal, it would emit sulfate. So we used to, we actually have some monitors that will actually speciate what's in the PM2.5. It'll tell you if it, there's a sulfate component, a nitrate component, and we've seen that sulfate component drop considerably in the last probably decade because of people switching from coal to natural gas boilers. And there's been more controls put on the, the coal fired boilers. So we've seen a, that's really dropped down and it's really lowered our PM 2.5 levels. The only time we ever have PM 2.5 issues now is typically with some sort of an inversion. Maybe it's a wintertime inversion or really strong inversion in the summertime, you might tend to have a high, potentially a high day. But usually in the summertime, once the sun comes out and heats things up, it breaks that inversion up. And it, it, it's really amazing to see sometimes, you'll see in the morning, the PM 2.5 levels are high and about 11 o'clock, <laughs> they just bottom out. You know, once that upper atmosphere expands, mm -hmm. then it just, it dilutes the whole atmosphere and the levels go down. So it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty neat to watch. We had an, um, if you recall, there was a fire in downtown, a tire fire. Yeah, at, I remember that. Yes. Um, and I was at work that day, and in the morning, it was just a calm, still morning, and it was just the whole downtown filled with smoke. But mm -hmm. by the time the, the afternoon rolled around, it was a really sunny day that day, and it, as soon as the atmosphere heated up, it just lifted everything, and the level was just they went from super high to just super low in a matter of time. And you could actually see the plume going straight up in the atmosphere where before it was going up and capping and just filling that whole bowl, you know, in the downtown area. But once it, that inversion broke, then the levels um, just dropped. So it's, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon to watch, I should say. Yeah, it definitely is. It's always nice to see a, a, another science nerd in a different field. <laughs> 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 well, I think, Brian, that this is, um, a lot of people probably maybe aren't super familiar with RAPCO. We talk about you guys all the time because we will show the pollen counts, um, and we're very grateful that your agency is able to not only produce that, but also, um, you know, the ozone count and, and that kind of thing for the public. It's a big deal. People want to know what's going on in their air when they're breathing it. Um, is there anything else that you want to add about RAPCA and what you guys are doing for the public? And Maybe any goals that you have for 2020? Um, well, I will say if people are interested in the air quality alerts, they, they can go on onto, um, there's a service called EnviroFlash. And if they were to just Google search EnviroFlash or they think they can get to it th through our website, um, they can sign up for alerts. And really they can sign up for any city. And you can go in, we issue daily forecasts for air pollution. And with that, you can set the level to see every forecast or you can only get the alerts when there's going to be an advisory. So that's one thing, excuse me, um, that I would encourage people to do if they're interested. And we do post a lot of data on our website. If you're, if you're kind of a data nerd and you want to see a lot of things, we do have some things on our website that you might find interesting. Um, and if there's any questions, people can always reach out to me and ask. But we, we post all of our pollen and mold counts, typically all of our pollen and mold counts when we have them. Uh, we also post hourly data. We post hourly AQI data. That's one thing maybe people don't understand. We report numbers in, uh, like for ozone, it's parts per billion. And in PM 2.5, it's, it's a concentration, micrograms per meters cubed. Well, that's really confusing for people to follow. So there's, there's an equation. We convert those numbers over to an AQI number. And that's what maybe people are are used to seeing like zero to 50 is good air quality, right. 51 to 100 is moderate, that sort of thing. So, um, but we post both of that, all that information on our website so people can kind of follow along. Um, but, you know, some of the other things that we do, you know, we also, um, we're, you know, we're a regulatory agency, so we work to promote clean air in the Miami Valley. So we, we monitor for air pollution and we also regulate uh, facilities and just, you know, to control air pollution. So, 
uh, those are kind of our main uh, uh, services to um, to the area. That's wonderful. Yeah, and I'll say the website, uh, the Ravka website is very helpful. If you want to nerd out and kind of like see everything, you can really get into the weeds. You can see what kind of species of tree might be up that day and um, learn a lot about the air quality and things like that. So I would say head over there, as Brian said, if, you, if you're interested and that's something that impacts you a lot on a daily basis. Definitely. So this will be coming out May 1st. So everyone that's listening to us, we are heading into a new month. And um, I know, Brian, that you do have a lot of people that faithfully follow those pollen numbers. So if anybody is wondering why there may be a little bit of a lag or a hiccup going on right now, why don't you give a quick update to, um, you know, what's going on and when those numbers will likely start or hopefully would be able to start becoming more regular. Okay, well, like we mentioned earlier, we had to, we had to shut our sampler down in mid-March due to COVID. We're hopeful that we'll open things back up in the next week or two. So that means hopefully we'll have those daily pollen and mole counts available. But you can always use the, uh, we have some links on our website where you can get to the automated sampler data as well. Um, we, that sampler actually has stopped working this week. Um, but we're hopeful that that'll get back up and running here in the next week or two as well. Yeah. I mean, everyone's got to be patient. We have, we're all dealing with such a different um, and unique setup being in a pandemic and trying to just kind of do what we can and, and make, make the best of it. So I think people will show your department grace as well, because it is a struggle for you guys. Definitely different for your setup as it is for us. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you all for uh, listening to Cloudy with a Chance of Podcast or watching our vodcast version. Um, I think we're really starting to get the hang of this, Kirsty, of doing yeah. vodcasts and having more video versions. If you want to listen to our podcasts, you can subscribe and download. If you have an iPhone, we use the Apple uh, Podcast app there and just look for Cloudy with a Chance of Podcast. You can search WHIO.com. We also have it there as well in a drop down link. Uh, Google Play, Stitcher, WHIO.com, as I mentioned. Also, we do have these video versions streaming on our app there as well. So if you have a smart TV or you have Amazon Fire, Roku, Apple TV, just search for WHIO. You'll see the little icon looks much like the app that you have on your phone. Download there and there is a, a video version of this podcast as well. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.